Today, uh, we're going to be talking about pastors and elders. So you're going to be picking on me and Pastor Matt here today. So that's okay. We can take it. You only get wrong children. No. But uh, that's where we're at today. And uh, we're going through the book of 1 Timothy, uh, the fifth chapter. We're coming out of these uh, verses 17 through 25. We're talking about biblical eldership. It's important that we understand this. All of God's word is important. Amen? Every bit from Genesis to Revelation. It's inspired, infallible, it's God's Word. The only book that God wrote was the Bible, and it's all important, and we need to know it. And so, before we get into this biblical eldership, uh, let's do a little recap here. Last week, in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verses 9 through 16, the Apostle Paul continued with instruction to help Timothy lead the church at Ephesus to understand their responsibility to widows. He gave three more principles to guide that ministry. Number one, the obligation of the church to maintain high standards for widows who serve in the church. Number two, the obligation of the church to instruct younger widows to remarry. And number three, the obligation of the church to make sure that capable family members support their widows. God's special love and care for widows must be reflected and the actions of his people. God loves them very much. Now today, in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verses 17 through 25, the Apostle Paul teaches Timothy, the Ephesians, and us, how to restore a truly biblical eldership. He does not repeat the qualifications he has given in chapter 3, he is not concerned here with the character and qualifications of the over overseer, but how the church views him. In setting his thoughts on these features, Paul opens to us the obligation of the church to its pastors. In so doing, he notes four principles defining biblical eldership. Number one, honoring elders. Number two, protecting elders. Number three, rebuking elders, ouch, and number four, selecting elders. But first of all, in verses 17 and 18, Paul reveals that honoring elders is the first principle defining biblical eldership. He declares, uh, declares, look with me, with verse 17 and 18. He says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Well, there are three main titles given to the men who pastor churches. And you probably have heard, have heard of these names. And they are bishop, pastor, and elder. They, that Three, that these three titles are described uh, that let me back up. that these titles all describe the same person is made clear by the use of all three words to describe the same man in Acts chapter 20 verse 17 and verse 28 so it's the same person with three different functions the term bishop means overseer and refers to their authority and leading function. The term pastor emphasizes their shepherding or feeding function. And the term elder emphasizes their spiritual maturity and leading and ruling function. So three titles, same person, three different functions. The first principle and the first step Toward restoring biblical eldership involves giving proper honor to those elders who serve faithfully in the church. When I was putting this together, I thought, you know, it's kind of odd when you're preaching and it's about you, it's not yourself. You know, it just makes you feel a little odd, but that's okay, you know, because uh, the Word of God is directed to all of us, and sooner or later it hits us, it gets us. It, so, you know, God's Word is wonderful, it's infallible, it's perfect, and I love it. How about you, amen? I love the Word of God. Well, the term honor here generally refers to respect or regard. It can also refer to financial support. Uh, 
according to Matthew 27, verse 6, Acts 4, 34, verse 26, 20, where it is translated price, which speaks of giving an offering to God. That usage is uh, similar to the English word honor honorarium, which refers to money given someone to honor them. Paul, as was his custom, does not refer to money directly here. He refers instead to deal with the hard attitude that will result in remuneration. Those who honor elders will not begrudge generosity in paying their support. All elders are entitled to financial support as well as respect. Though Paul chose to support himself in his evangelistic efforts in pagan cities, those who do not are in no sense inferior and are to be supported by the church. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 14 talk about that, Philippians 4, verses 10 through 20, and other scriptures. While all elders are to be honored, Paul singles out some as being worthy of double honor. What does that mean? Well, he differentiates between the general category of elders and those who serve with greater commitment, effort, and excellence. They are worthy of greater acknowledgement from the congregation they serve. Paul is not here saying that they should receive exact twice the pay a normal elder receives. Rather, they should receive ample generous remuneration and respect beyond that of other elders whose labors are not as diligent. Paul gives two qualifications that mark elders as worthy of double honor. First, he says, they rule well. The term rule means to stand before or to stand first or to pre preside. Elders are first in terms of leadership according to God's word. They have the oversight of the church according to 1 Peter 5, 2 and are to care for it according to chapter 3 and verse 5. Because they are in charge according to 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 they have a great responsibility. Hebrews 13, 17. Amen? Great responsibility. When that privileged duty is discharged with unusual excellence, they should be compensated accordingly. Paul's emphasis, however, is not on the verb here, but on the adverb, well, the word well. The term well could be translated with excellence. Paul is not here setting up two categories of elders, those who rule and those who preach and teach, as some churches have done nor is he contrasting holy and setting elders. The latter would be disqualified and not an elder at all. Paul's contrast is among faithful and gifted elders to point out those who surpass the others in the excellence of their ministry. <laughs> Paul further describes such men as especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's tear that apart. Well, the term especially means chiefly or particularly. The assumption is that some elders would not work as hard in preaching and teaching as others. Uh, their role may be less prominent in those areas. The term labor means to work hard to the point of fatigue or exhaustion. It does not stress the amount of work, but rather the effort. A man's reward from God is proportional to the excellence of his ministry and the effort he puts into it. Excellence combined with diligence mark a man worthy of the highest honor. Paul says, labor in word and doctrine. Well, the term word here literally means speech and could be translated preaching. It is public pro proclamation of the truth that includes exhortation and admonition. The term doctrine emphasizes the idea of instruction more than proclamation and could be translated teaching. So, preaching and teaching. Something I love to do. Preaching calls for a heart response to God 
while teaching is a necessary bulwark against heresy. Well, Paul supports his point in verse 18 by quoting from both the Old and New Testament. He says, for the scripture says, and this is his usual way of introducing a biblical <coughs> reference when he says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. And this is a quote from Deuteronomy 20, verse, uh, uh, chapter 25 and verse 4. And then I mentioned again in 1 Corinthians 9.9. You see, the Old Testament law provided that the oxen who threshed the grain were entitled to eat of it. They were not to be muzzled to prevent them from doing that. Paul's point is obvious. God required that animals who labored to provide physical food for others were to be fed. How much more would he want faithful pastors who provide spiritual food uh, to their needy flocks to be provided for? sense, doesn't it? Well, the second quote, the labor is worthy of his wages, is from Luke chapter 10 and verse 7. It is very noteworthy here that Paul refers to Luke's writing as scripture. Very important. Well, with the second quote, Paul moves up a level from an animal to a servant. The Bible insists that servants are to be paid, according to Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, and James 5, 4. To refuse to, to support those who provide spiritual food is as unjust and heartless as muscling an animal or refusing to pay a hired person. Next, in verse 19, Paul reveals the second principle for defining biblical eldership, and that is protecting elders. I was thinking there that um, verse 18 that um, seems a little odd to uh, be compared to an ox. What do you think, Matt? So we're compared to an ox. You know, as an ox who treads out the grain, you know, we, we are to be taken care of like an ox. I was thinking about that one. Not an ox, you know, they got broad shoulders, they're strong, you know. Um, I will tell you what mother thinks I've heard about ox. <laughs> 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 I can't at home with me too much. You know. But anyway, let's keep going here. Uh, we see here now we're, uh, elders are supposed to be protected by the congregation. Verse 19, he says, Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Well, so, since elders occupy a position of great responsibility in the church, they become a special target of Satan's attack. And how true that is. Because he knows if he can uh, destroy the leader, he can scatter the sheep. Right? He knows that. For this reason, the Spirit of God takes steps to guard them against false accusations. Because false accusation is a very real danger... Paul gives Timothy instruction on how to deal with allegations against elders. So, first, unsubstantiated ones are to be rejected, he says. The term receive means to entertain or to consider in your mind. Such allegations are not to be investigated but ignored. That the simple act of turning a deaf ear to them is one of the best ways of protecting elders. The term accusation is a compound word from the Greek word uh, kata, meaning against, and agora, meaning public meeting place. Such a public accusation is not to be entertained. Why? Because it is simply emotional words with no evidence. And obviously we're going to get into, you know, why it's important also if a pastor or leader is guilty. Obviously you don't want to cover that up. You want to dig into that. But here it's referring to someone out of an emotional state that simply says something about an elder, uh, remarks about him, and there's no evidence. They say, the Bible is telling us you just put that aside and don't pay any attention to it. Second, Paul gives the conditions under which an accusation against an elder is to be taken seriously. The church is not to do so, he says, except from two or three witnesses. The accusation may yet prove false, but it must at least be investigated. 
the intent of having two or three witnesses is to provide confirmation. Now, that's what it's for. Uh, Deuteronomy 19.15 talks about that, and in Matthew 18.16. That is not meant to place elders beyond successful accusation, but beyond illegitimate ac accusation. They are never to be at the mercy of frivolous, evil accusers, and that can happen at times. Those who set out to falsely accuse God's servants are treading on dangerous ground. Well, next in verse 20 and 21, Paul reveals the third principle for defining biblical eldership, that is, rebuking elders, he declares. Verse 20, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Well, it is, it is very important that elders are protected from false accusations, but they are never to be protected if they are guilty. The term sinning refers to one who keeps missing the mark in his relationship to God. Matthew 27, 4 relates to that. Those elders who continue to sin must bear the consequences. You, it's interesting, Paul does not mention here any specific kinds of sin. Any sin that caused an elder to violate the qualifications listed in chapter 3, verses 2 through 7 of 1 Timothy would be grounds or rebuke in the presence of all. If you if you are able, turn with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And let's look at verses 2 through 7 to start with. You might use your smartphone too if you're able. Oh, I said you're able. She thought I was getting on to it because her future smartphone over there. No, it's all right as long as it's not making a bunch of noise. With you. So 1 Timothy 3 and verses 2, let's start at verse 1. It says, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires a, a position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Here it is, a bishop then must be blameless. That word blameless has the idea, not sinless, but if, uh, when, he, when a man sins, he, he quickly takes care of that sin through, as we know, 1 John 1, 9. Um, uh, it talks about if, you, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So blameless means that it's talking about a person who keeps short accounts with God, right? Uh, in other words, when they do sin, they do wrong, they quickly, it hurts them, it convicts their heart, and they make it right with God. That's a blameless person. So, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Must, moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, go with me over to the book of Titus. And we see in the first chapter here some more things mentioned for elders. Qualifications for elders. Let's look at the start of verse 5. Uh, talking to Titus, uh, Paul talking to Titus, says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city, as I command you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation uh, or insubordination, 
For a bishop must be blameless, a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, so reminded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who conquer death. So I want us to see that, as I just mentioned it in, in our message here, but I want us to see and understand that when Paul says here that if he sins, uh, what he's talking about, if he is disqualified according to those uh, qualifications there in, in Timothy and Titus is what he's talking about. He says, if that's the case, then he should be rebuked in the presence of all. There are no elaborate steps of discipline to be followed. An accusation is made and confirmed by two or three witnesses, then investigated. That's the steps that happen. If found true, the elder is publicly rebuked. The term rebuke here means to expose, to bring to open conviction, to correct or to reprove. There are no exegetical grounds for limiting the word all to just the elders. It means everyone, elders and the congregation. A sinning elder has nowhere to hide. He should be brought before the entire congregation. Amen? The way it should be. I know these things are uncomfortable to talk about, but they happen. And it happens in a lot of churches. Uh, and unfortunately, even in our conference, we've had elders who have sinned in ways that have disqualified them from ministry. And sometimes that happens and you have to deal with that. So God's Word shows us what to do. And what about He gives us the instruction of what to do when this happens. The sins of a man in leadership role are more serious and are to be punished more severely. James 3 1 talks about that. The ministry is thus a two edged sword. Those who serve faithfully are to be honored, but those who sin are to be removed and publicly rebuked. One of the purpose for public rebuke is so that the rest, Paul says, also may fear. The phrase, the rest, refers to the others in the same class. Well, what class is that? Well, the class in view here is that of elders. When one elder is publicly disgraced because of sin, that puts a healthy fear into the hearts of the others. Makes sense, doesn't it? It also puts the same fear in the hearts of the congregation. God is serious about us living holy lives. Amen? Not just pastors. I mean, that, that's where it has to start. Right? And I should be the main example of that. But it's all of us. If we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, He expects us to live like Him. We say we're Christian, and we should act like one. Amen? <coughs> That means separated from the world, being different. No, not sinless, not perfect, no. Uh, but uh, it means walking close to Jesus. To publicly rebuke a sitting elder takes great courage. It does. It's hard to do. And in a lot of churches, it doesn't happen. And what happens is that the church is not got a lot of energy going on. Lest he be tempted to shirk that responsibility, Paul commands Timothy in verse 21. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Paul reminds Timothy that God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels are watching. <coughs> Sometimes we forget, don't we? Sometimes we forget that God sees everything. Even our motives, our thoughts, everything. He sees more than any of us. He sees more than we see ourselves. He knows all about us. He knows all our intent. He knows all our motives. He knows our desire. He knows our what we're lusting after, what we're desiring after. He knows all of that. So we must remember God's Lord. They are the ones to fear, not the reaction of the people in the congregation. All heaven is concerned with the purity of the church. The church that tolerates sinning elders to protect its reputation on earth will lose its reputation in heaven. Big difference. 
The church must observe these principles regarding sinning elders without prejudice or bias. Doing nothing with partiality, Paul says. In other words, no one is to receive preferential treatment. The rebuke of sinning elders must be done with accuracy and integrity. There must be no effort to protect those who are famous or specially gifted or popular or maybe they have a big family in the church uh, in order to expose those who are not. The question, the attitude of those involved must be one of sorrow, not self-righteousness. That's what God wants to see in it. A sorrowful heart that we sin. Right? But sometimes people try to hide their sin. You know what? I'd say we all have done that. Amen? Haven't we all have tried to hide our sin at one time or another? I need to say that, but that's a truth. God sees it all. You know? So it's very good for us to keep short accounts of it. Spend much time in prayer. Open up your heart to God. And just talk to Him about everything in your life. Oh, I tell you what, it makes a difference in my life. How about you? It makes a huge difference when we just spend much time in prayer. Just open up our heart. Talk to Him about your struggle. Talk to Him about your temptations. Talk to Him about your what's going on in your life. God cares about every little detail of our life. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? That's wonderful. We should praise Him for that. The question facing any church is whether it is more concerned about its reputation or God's holiness. We should be more concerned about what God thinks. Amen? Than anything else. Next, in verses 25 to, uh, 22 to 25, Paul reveals the fourth principle for defining biblical eldership, and that is selecting elders. This is also very important. important. Let's look at verse 25 or 22 to start with. Paul says, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Well, when prominent men identify themselves with the local church, there is sometimes a tendency to advance them quickly to positions of responsibility. That has happened in a lot of different churches. Well, here, Timothy is warned against haste in doing so. The best way to prevent unqualified elders from serving in the ministry is not to lay hands on anyone hastily, Paul says. So let's look at that. Let's kind of tear that apart a little bit, see what he's talking about. Well, to lay hands on anyone in, in this context was to affirm their suitability for and acceptance into public ministry. In other words, you're saying, I put my approval on this person. That's what you're saying. It expressed solidarity, union, and identification with them. The practice had its roots in the Old Testament. It derived from the practice of laying hands on a sacrificial animal to identify with it. Laying on of hands also symbolizes identification in the New Testament. And we call that ordination. Ordination in the New Testament was done by three groups. First, the apostles ordained elders, according to Acts 14, 23. So did close associates of the apostles, such as Timothy and Titus, according to Titus 1, 5. In the third phase, the existing elders in a church ordained other elders, 1 Timothy 4, 14. Today, since the first two groups have passed from the scene, the responsibility falls upon the elders of the church. It's responsible for them about laying hands and approving another holy. And obviously that goes through the congregation also. To lay hands on someone then is to set them apart for ministry. It must not be hastily, Paul says. Thorough investigation must precede ordination. To fail to do so leaves the church liable to share in other people's sins. So it is serious if we say we approve someone, if the church says, I approve this person, then uh, you're saying, I, I'm, I, I'm sharing in this person's actions. You know? That's what he's saying here. The term share is the verb form of the New Testament word for fellowship. Hasty ordination without proper examination, and that happens in a lot of churches and denominations across the country. One thing I do, I do respect 
uh, and like in our uh, our uh, fellowship, is that uh, we take the time. Uh, the men have to be they have to be going through a test. They have to answer questions as if they they are questioned uh, whether or not they qualify. If they understand the Bible, I mean, it, um, I was sharing with when I was at the conference. I picked up a book, a biography of Dr. Whitman. Uh, his um, daughter-in-law was there. Uh, I was talking with her, and I was sharing with her how Dr. Whitman was on the ordination panel for my question to be a doctor the ordain. I said, how intimidating was that? But I said, he was the very one that caused me to pass. I said, I just love that guy. <laughs> But uh, I'll never forget it. I mean, it just stood out so much in my mind, you know. And I was so nervous, and it's so hard. And Pastor Matty knows what I mean. When you you got twelve senior pastors around you, and they're drilling you and all this stuff, you know. And uh, oh no, that's intimidating. And there went there sits Dr. Whitkin, you know, and he's asking questions. Why are you doing this? But he he told the guys. He said, and I think I was out of the room at this time when they were considering. Passing me, um, he says. Listen to his testimony of how he was called into the ministry. He said, "How can we refuse that man?" <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so praise the Lord. You know, but boy, that was so hard. But I, what I, what I'm saying in all of this is that I, I respect our our conference, our fellowship because they take this serious. Amen. Amen. They they take this serious. <clears throat> And that's important because I know of other churches and other denominations, they don't take this seriously. They put in just about anyone. And they ordain in just about anyone. And folks, that's dangerous. Very dangerous. This has to be taken very serious. And so, uh, hasty ordination without proper examination makes these those responsible culpable in the man's sin. God's chastening may be on a church not only for the leader's sin, but also for the sins of those who fail to properly evaluate that man. Very important, isn't it, who we say we approve or not approve. Paul exhorts Timothy in this matter. He says to keep yourself pure. Well, the term keep means to exercise careful watch by not lifting up unqualified leaders and thus avoiding participation in their sins, Timothy would remain pure. And so he should keep his own life personally pure, as we should, but also in this thought about putting your approval uh, uh, on elders. Verse 23 is a personal note, a parenthetical aside to Timothy in which Paul clarifies his exhortation to purity in verse 22. By calling for Timothy to remain pure, Paul was not advocating a severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. In other words, he didn't mean he just couldn't do anything. He did not want Timothy to in injure his health. So Paul here in verse 23 is concerned about Timothy's health. Therefore, Paul encouraged Timothy, verse 23, he says, as no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach sake, stomach sake, sake, say that little fast, and your frequent infirmities. Well, being an elder, Timothy had obviously committed himself to total abstinence from wine. He desired to be a model of spiritual virtue and never establish a pattern that could make someone uh, uh, assume liberty that would be destroy them. Romans 14, 13 through 23 talks about that, and 1 Corinthians 8, verses 12 and 13. In other words, we might have a liberty to do something ourselves, but we've got to be careful. We take that liberty, and a, uh, a, a less mature person, a Christian, they see us, and they think, well, if he's doing it, I can do it. They do it, they might be sinning. We call our brother or sister to sin. We've got to be careful. Just because we have the, uh, the right to do something doesn't mean we should do it. Amen? We've got to be so careful about what we allow in our lives. What Paul is doing is instructing Timothy not to let that commitment injure his health. You see, water in the ancient world was impure and carried uh, a lot of diseases such as dysentery. If I say that right, 
Paul's advice to use a little wine would help safeguard Timothy's health from the sickness-producing effects of polluted water. Just like you heard me mention about in uh, Africa, they, their water is terrible. That's why they get malaria all the time. And so we see the same thing going on here uh, with, with Timothy. It was also in keeping with the medicinal use of wine in the ancient world. By advocating the temporary curative use of wine, Paul does not ask Timothy to alter his commitment to the highest standard of behavior for leaders. Timothy, or Paul was just simply, uh, evidently there was something going on with Timothy and his health, obviously we don't know about, that Paul was concerned uh, for him, and that's why he uh, said this to him. Well, after this personal note to Timothy, Paul returns to his main emphasis of selecting elders. He gives four principles concerning that selection process in verses 24 and 25. He declares, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them for judgment, but those of some men follow later. Well, first, some men are obviously unfit to serve as elders and can be rejected right out of hand. Their sins are purely evident to all and precede them to judgment. In other words, their sins rush in before them like heralds announcing their guilt in advance. It's very clear. The judgment in view here is not the final judgment or the believer's judgment at the bema. Uh, rather, it refers to the church's assessment of the man's suitability to serve as an elder. Second, some of those, some those of some men follow later. What's he saying? Well, their sins are not evident beforehand, but come to light during the church's assessment of them or their examination. In verse 25, Paul reveals the third and fourth principle for selecting elders. He declares, likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Third, the good works of some are clearly evident. It is obvious from the quality of some men's character that they are qualified to serve as elders. A long, drawn-out discussion of their qualifications is unnecessary. Finally, those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. The good deeds of some are not readily apparent. In other words, they cannot be hidden, however, and will come to light later during the examination process. Such men will also be found uh, not guilty, but qualified to serve as elders. You see, the church desperately needs qualified men to serve as pastors and elders. If you notice, when we mention about the churches in our conference, and I, if I'm remembering right, it's around 37, 38, something like that, last month. And probably it would be, would it be a, a third? Almost a third? Almost a third of our churches don't have that. We're in short supply of pastors. And unfortunately, what is happening in a lot of denominations, which I don't, you know, I don't agree with you, I don't agree with this, and I imagine it would agree with me, that since men are not stepping up, guess who are stepping up? Women are stepping up. So we're putting women in as pastors in a lot of the line, mainline denominations. Is that right biblically? Absolutely not. Impossible for them to qualify as elders. But that's what's going on. Because men aren't stepping up. And that's a, that's a, that's a, a problem. We're having Their lives must meet biblical standards. The church's responsibility to them is to honor and protect them, rebuke those who sin, and above all, to be very cautious in selecting them. If those four principles are implemented, the church will, will be well on its way to either maintaining or restoring biblical eldership. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that is, Lord, perfect. It's infallible, inherent. Lord, that is your perfect word. Thank you, Father, for instructing us, Lord, on the elders, the pastors, and so on. Lord, them uh, coming into the church, Lord, how the church should take care of them. And Lord, I pray that you would help us here at North Buffalo, Jesus. Lord, I pray for uh, 
Pastor Matt and myself, they could help us to stay more qualified and uh, pure before you, and Lord, that we might be a blessing to this congregation. You help us, Lord, be a blessing. Lord, bless this congregation. And Lord, I pray that you might raise up more men, Lord, that may uh, uh, go from here and maybe even fill in some of the churches that don't have pastors or even start churches. We don't know, Father, but I pray that you would just work in hearts. May you be glorified through it all, Father. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.